Okay, let's go ahead and get started for today. I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW Whitewater. And we have hosted the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services since 1983. We're very happy to be back here this spring after being gone for a couple of years. Um, and you may want to show that we're now um, opening the lectures up to the public. So you don't have to be a resident of Fairhaven to attend the lectures uh, at this point. We're very happy about that. So please spread that word if you if you have others in the community who'd like to join us. Um, uh, let's go ahead and start with today's lecture. Kimberly North is a historian of early America and the American Revolution. She earned her PhD from the University of Delaware in 2016 in American history. She also holds a BA in history from the University of Arizona and an MA in history from the University of Maryland College Park. Her research focuses on moralism, property confiscation, and loyalist reintegration in the Revolutionary War period. Publications include Moralism, Citizenship, American Identity, The Shoemaker Family, and Book, The American Revolution Reborn, and Left Behind, Loyalist Women in Philadelphia During the American Revolution, in the book Women in, in the American Revolution, Gender, Politics, and the Domestic World. In addition to teaching courses in early America and the American Revolution, Dr. North also teaches courses in American women and gender history, public history, and material culture. She has previously worked at the National Archives and Record Administration and previously taught at Stockton University. Please welcome Professor Kimberly North. Thank you. Thanks for having me here to kind of start us out with our first open lecture in quite a long time. Um, so as Carrie very kindly introduced me, I want to talk to you about something that's very close to me in terms of my research and look at loyalist women in revolutionary Philadelphia. So I've titled this An Opportunity and a Burden, and I'm really going to unpack that idea and what that means. So let's kind of get started with this. I wanted to start with some kind of classic images when we think about women in the American Revolution. I'm guessing that some of these may even look a little bit familiar to you. Has anybody seen any of these before? I was hoping you had. <laughs> so I wanted to start over here. Um, that, of course, is going to be Betsy Ross, uh, the one that we most closely associate with the first American flag. So that's going to be kind of our iconoclastic, like patriotic woman, right, kind of holding us up. In the middle, that's going to be Martha Washington, quite literally our first first lady. So again, like this classic patriot woman, someone that we closely associate with freedom and independence, and of course, George Washington. And the final image, I'm guessing, is one that you maybe haven't seen quite as often, but I suspect when I say the name, I'm going to get some nods. That's the artist's rendering of Molly Pitcher. So again, that kind of exceptional story that I tend to think about with women in the American Revolution, this woman who brazenly takes up arms and right, fights on behalf of the patriot cause. But this is just one side. What I like to focus on and what my research has emphasized over the years is kind of the others, those loyalists. We're so quick to just think about the victors of the American Revolution, but I'm really curious about those loyalist women, those women that were on the losing side. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that today. Who's a loyalist? Well, in the most simple of terms, it's somebody that sided with Great Britain. Granted, they didn't really use the Union Jack, but I'm being illustrative at this point. But it's going to be those people that identified with the British flag and the British crown and they wanted to stay part of England. Historians estimate that that could have been as many as a third of all colonists at the time of the war. But there's more that I think it's unpacked in that. Could a woman be political? Could she have a political voice? Could she have a political identity, or did her identity just have to be that of her husband? And it turns out, as we kind of explore this and understand this more, it gets a lot messier. I 
I think the American Revolution is very clear to figure out what it means for a man at this time. If you're a loyalist man, you take up arms for Great Britain. You fight on behalf of King George III, and that is what you do. But what do you do if you're a loyalist woman? So I wanted to look at this today in a series of case studies. I find it very challenging to just make a sweeping statement here. But I wanted to look at these case studies, and I wanted to look specifically at Philadelphia. So this is one of my favorite maps. I absolutely love historical maps. So this is historical Philadelphia right on the eve of the American Revolution. It's something I'd like to see. But what it kind of shows us is it's a very developed city at this point. I believe estimates for the population were around about 30,000 people for Philadelphia at this time period, so a sizable population, on par with other places like Boston and New York. And Philadelphia is also very interesting, we'll talk about this, but they were occupied by the British for nine months. So the British controlled the city of Philadelphia beginning in 1777 until they relinquished control in June of 1778. Why this matters? It's really easy to talk about the period of occupation. The British were in control and knew exactly what happened. But what about in that period before? And what about in that period after? And what did it mean for women? It's a very easy case for men. They took up arms and they fought, but the women were left behind. So what did these loyalist women do? And what was their point in staying home? So let's look at a couple of different cases to see how we can unpack these ideas and think about these loyalist women. So the first case study is going to involve a woman by the name of Susanna Marshall. So Susanna Marshall is really fascinating. I found her when I was going through a record collection. But Susanna Marshall is a woman who is extremely extraordinary, um, given the hardship that she faced on the eve of the war. Susanna was originally from the city of Baltimore. So if you've ever been out east, Baltimore and Philadelphia, about an hour drive from each other if there's no traffic. <laughs> but I'm talking modern cars with modern roads. So Susanna, on the eve of the American Revolution, this is actually June of 1776, she decided that she needed to leave her home of Baltimore and go find the British troops. Her husband had already left, He'd already taken up arms, and she was left behind with her children. And it was her burden to care for them, her children, and she was scared. When she was in Philadelphia, or Philadelphia, she hoped for sanctuary, so she set off. And she did so very interestingly. She didn't have a horse. She didn't have money. But she had this pursuit, this want to go find the British soldiers. And she was actually looking for Lord Dunmore, if he wanted to be very specific. She'd heard that he was in the area, and she thought she could go find him. So she takes up on foot with her children, and to no one's surprise, she doesn't make it to the city of Philadelphia. She stops short. Her children are hungry. So she stops in a place that's about halfway between. It's called Head of Elk, or it's, today it's actually called Elkton, Maryland. So it's right on the Chesapeake Bay, and actually right on the border between Maryland and Delaware. And she stops there, and she decides that instead of going to Philadelphia, her next pursuit is going to be to run a tavern. Believe it or not, this was seen as an acceptable profession for women. It gave her a way to earn a living. She could provide for her children, but it also provided shelter. So this was Susanna's plan. So she ran out tavern, and she stayed there from about July of 1776 until March of 1777. It's a pretty good run. But in March of 1777, the war is intensifying, and Susanna hears a ruling from Congress that if any loyalists were to quit the colonies, just up and leave, there would be no negative consequences. There was a catch. Any loyalist, they were an enemy, so they weren't allowed to take anything with them, including any physical property or money. Well, Susanna, she'd already learned that lesson. So what she decided to do was, in direct defiance of the law, she held a public auction. She sold everything in her possession, including the tavern, and she took the money to charter a schooner. She took that boat down to St. Augustine with her children because she wanted to find sanctuary from the American Revolution. It's a little bit more interesting, too. In the schooner, she took her children, but also venison, ham, 
bacon. Ashuka Hogs had a flower. She wanted enough goods to provide for her children, but also trade. So what's also kind of fascinating about this, and this is where it gets a little bit hard to believe, but I promise you it's true, is Susanna is on her way to St. Augustine, Florida. That's actually a sanctuary for the British at this time. So she's going down the coast, down to Florida, and her idea behind this is she's going to St. Augustine, she's going to regroup. From there, her ultimate goal is to go to San Domingue, which is Haiti. She'd heard a rumor that her husband was in Haiti, and she wanted to find him. So she's on her way, and then her boat is taken hostage. So she's actually taken hostage by pirates. And those pirates kind of seize her boat and her goods. And what they decide to do is they want to, you know, allow her and her children to live, but penniless. And they drop them off on the coast in St. Augustine, and they say, sorry, and they take everything she brought with her. Susanna, however, is a pretty defiant woman, as we can kind of guess from the story. And what she decides to do is she still convinces people to give her safe passage, and she instead goes to London. When she's in London, she unfortunately learns that her husband has passed away. And the reason that we know Susanna's story is kind of the final element here, is she petitions the British government for complete repayment of all of her lost property because of her loyalty to the crown. So she is, I mean, pretty awesome, let's be honest. But what she's also capable of doing is she claims that she's a loyalist. She claims this political identity. So that's my first case. The second case is a very different one, too, with Sarah Logan Fisher. So I included two images on the slide to kind of introduce her. The first image, this is her son, William Logan Fisher. The fact that I am able to include a portrait should tell you so much. If you have a portrait at this time, you have money. And Sarah Logan Fisher certainly did. Next to that is what's known as the Fisher's Wakefield Estate. They had one of many houses in the city of Philadelphia and kind of outside of it. They called this area that was just outside of the city the Northern Liberties. So they had some properties there, some properties in the city. She's another kind of interesting case, though, when we think about this. Sarah Logan Fisher was married to Thomas Fisher. And Thomas Fisher was, as you can guess, fairly wealthy, fairly well-connected, and he was also a prime target. And there's another new element, too, that goes with them. The Fishers, they were Quakers. So if you are a Quaker, a fundamental tenet or belief that you hold is you cannot choose a side during war. You're a pacifist. That's kind of at the heart of the religious beliefs. So what do you do when a revolution breaks out? What do you do, too, when, for example, Pennsylvania requires every man to take an oath of allegiance to the Patriot cause? Do you side with your country or your faith? That's essentially what they're asking these people to choose. And Thomas Fisher was a devout Quaker, and he actually refused to take this oath. And in doing so, he essentially kind of labeled himself as a loyalist, because if you're not a patriot, then what are you? And in the laws at this time, there was no opportunity or ability to kind of be an other. So by not doing this, he put himself in the line of fire and was actually imprisoned. So Sarah faces her husband's kind of indefinite term in jail. To make matters worse, her husband was taken away this was in September of 1777, to a place in Virginia that was about eight hours by horse. And then there's one other piece of this. So he was about seven months pregnant. So she's seven months pregnant with her child. Her husband has been accused of being a loyalist, and he's taken away to prison, and she has no idea if and when he's going to return. What Sarah did, which is really remarkable, is she kept this great diary that we can go look at and find out about her experiences. She didn't worry so much about the action that was happening during the war. She worried about her house. She worried about her children. There's this line there. She said, quote, I have nothing to eat but salt meat and biscuits, end quote. She feared that she would be able to provide for her children. 
and she was worried this whole time. The month before she gave birth to her daughter, she wrote, quote, I have to think and provide everything for my family at a time when it is so difficult to provide anything at any price. Sarah struggled during the separation. She fortunately gave birth to a healthy baby girl, but she had to do it alone. And she ended up being reunited with her husband in April of 1778. But they were apart for seven months. And we missed, right, that birth of her child. He wasn't there to provide those things. And I just can't think that that was an easy kind of moment for her. Also, just so much uncertainty. She never made a great claim of royalism, but she was punished as if she was one when her husband was taken away. It gets a little bit messier when you look at the city of Philadelphia. So I mentioned very briefly at the beginning that the city was occupied. I'm going to go back to that for just a moment. So again, three kind of images. You guys can probably tell I really like images and stuff. But I wanted to talk about the impact of Philadelphia. So over here on the left, this is Sir William Howe, General Howe, if you've read your history military textbooks. So he had a great plan um, to take the city of Philadelphia. His idea for the British was that they would essentially seize control of various port cities and cut off the Patriots. So they first took New York. And the next one they were going to take was Philadelphia and kind of just squeeze that entire East Coast down. Um, and in doing so, he had a very kind of distinctive strategy. He came up through Head of Elk in Maryland, uh, through what is now the state of Delaware, up to the Battle of Brandywine, which is just on that border leading into Pennsylvania, and took the city of Philadelphia. And in doing so, that's a pretty huge blow. Philadelphia at the time is acting as the capital for the Patriots. It's kind of their stronghold. Um, and what we see is that in doing that, they forced this Pennsylvania government to flee to nearby Lancaster, Pennsylvania. They have to just go running. And the British take the city, and it's seen as this great victory. Upon taking the city, General Howe does a couple of other things. One, he runs a muck in the streets. He welcomes everyone that might be a loyalist to the city of Philadelphia. And something like 2,000 people flee there. It's a pretty substantial population. Uh, they all have to be housed somewhere, along with the soldiers that are controlling the city. So they let themselves into Patriots' homes. They use all of their stuff. Uh, they take their furniture. They rearrange it. There's some great articles about this, too. I think it's pretty cool. And they take the city. What they also do in this time, too, is they welcome anyone that wants to lead George Washington to also come there. So deserters from Valley Forge, in part, find their way to the city of Philadelphia during that winter because it's so harsh and it's so cold. And they seek sanctuary behind these British lines. The British controlled this space until June 18th, 1778. Washington did rally his troops. He did come up with a plan. He did take the city back. But there's some interesting outcomes from this. One thing we see very practically is the city of Philadelphia is largely kind of in shambles. The total damage that those loyalists did to the city is estimated to be around 150,000 pounds sterling at that time period. I don't have a good estimate to tell you what that would be worth today, but that's a lot of money back then. What we also see, too, is the Pennsylvania legislature, they're angry, and they want to get back at all those loyalists. So during this period of occupation, they passed a series of acts, including this one, which is most important. And it called for, quote, all personal estates and effects belonging to those who supported the King of Great Britain and gone within the British lines to be seized. So what the Pennsylvania legislature did is the most common practice of war. You take the stuff of your enemy. Think about that. Makes sense if you're a loyalist man and you're gone and your, your stuff's left behind. But what about for the women? Most of the men that joined the British troops, they didn't take their wife and their kids. 
So these women were all left behind, and a lot of the purpose of Mythos was for them to protect their homes. The husbands were explicitly trusting that their wives would be there and they would do anything possible to secure their estates. It's a gamble. We don't know what the outcome is necessarily going to be. What I encourage you to think about this, too, for these women, here's the map again I wanted to show you guys another little illustration, is how do you secure your estates, though? Do you claim that your husband's a loyalist and you aren't? Do you say, okay, maybe we are loyalists, but like my kids are here and they're starving? Turns out the women did a little bit of everything, as you can probably guess. Um, here's another map showing basically the ways in which the British attacked the naval ships off the coastline. I think it's a pretty cool um, illustration to show us some of this, just south of the city of Philadelphia. Um, but to think about this, what do you do? You're that woman and you're left behind. So the third case, Grace Grouty Galloway. And again, as you can probably guess from these portraits, very wealthy individuals. Grace Grouty Galloway, painted over here. Uh, this was kind of her wedding portrait. Um, was married to Joseph Galloway, illustrated over here. Joseph Galloway was a very important individual arguably one of the most wealthy Pennsylvania statesmen, and actually attended sessions of the First Continental Congress, so the meetings that precede the American Revolution. And what Joseph did was he decided that the Patriots weren't in the right, and he joined the Loyalist cause. He fled when the city of Philadelphia fell, and he left his wife, Grace, behind to control the family estate. So Grace was left all alone. I should also note, too, that when Joseph fled, they decided that Joseph should leave with their teenage daughter, her name was Elizabeth. So Joseph and Elizabeth left, and Grace grabbed and got away. She was left behind. And she had a target on her from day one. Joseph was really well known for his loyalism. He'd actually operated kind of as a virtual governor for the city of Philadelphia during the occupation. He made a lot of these key decisions. So once the city fell, they wanted to take all of Joseph Galloway's property. But Grace was there. So Grace essentially argued with them, very vocally. The guy in charge was named Charles Wilson Peel. He was the agent in charge of confiscation of the British estates in Philadelphia. And he actively came to her door, banging on it, saying, Grace, I need to take your house. She didn't let him in. She refused. She allegedly buried some things in the front lawn. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but that's what it does say. But she told him that she would not give up her home. Grace claimed that she would be brought to beggary. That was the words that she, those were the words she, she used. She said she would be penniless, that she had nothing, that Joseph had left her behind and this was all she had was her house and the stuff that was inside of it. She was adamant about retaining ownership of her property as long as possible and she refused to leave. Charles Wilson Peel came back multiple times and tried to get her to leave her house. Grace absolutely refused. The only way that she was extricated from her property was he physically had to come in with several people and grab her from her property where she like, didn't still want to leave. She was clinging to the door frame. And only then did she leave her property. The state of Pennsylvania, they sold all of their stuff widely at public auctions. They made a lot of money off of it. Just to give you an idea of how much stuff these people actually had, the auction list for goods in their homes was 14 pages back and front. And it was really like expensive stuff, feather beds, silks, wine glasses. They drank a lot of wine back then. All their crystal decanters. They took all that from Grace. What's even a little bit sadder is that Grace died shortly thereafter. She wasn't in that great of health, and I can't imagine that she felt fantastic after losing her home and all of her stuff. 
and she never reunited with her husband or saw her daughter again. Another kind of interesting element about this is Joseph Galloway was permanently barred from ever returning to the state of Pennsylvania. He never did so again. So their estates were all lost and taken because of their loyalism. And Grace, too, in this kind of story, she suffered a great loss just trying to maintain that. But that was a very real outcome for her. A few more cases. Sarah Shepard and Margaret Locke. I don't have portraits for them because they aren't that wealthy or I guess they don't have that kind of recollection and historical kind of memory. But what we do see with Sarah Shepard and Margaret Locke, and this is showing kind of a glorified image of Philadelphia in the post-revolutionary er years, but I thought it made a nice background while I talked, was we see again these cases of women that are really trying to maintain ownership of their loyalist estates. I wanted to first talk about Sarah Shepard. Sarah Shepard was married to a Philadelphia loyalist by the name of William Shepard. And in 1777, he left to go to New Brunswick, New Jersey. Brunswick, New Jersey was seen as a loyalist sanctuary at the time. So he went over there. And the idea was that Sarah would stay behind in his absence, along with their three children, and try to protect their stuff until he could safely come back home didn't quite work out as planned. Sarah saw that her goods were almost immediately seized um, and sold at auction. She attempted to protect her property, and she made an interesting claim. In her legal claims, she said that the house belonged to her and not her husband. The deed had actually been originally transferred to Sarah. Her uncle had never married, and he willed the house to her. However, when a woman gets married in colonial Pennsylvania, once you get married, your property is transferred to your husband. This is the practice of coverture. So the question is, did Sarah actually own it or did her husband? And you can guess exactly what happened. The Pennsylvania legislature, they ruled that it belonged to her husband. So she lost the property that she'd inherited from her, hus or her uncle, and everything else was deemed her husband, and it was all gone. Sarah and her children, they fled the city of Philadelphia because they were now homeless. They too went to New Jersey, and eventually they ended up in England by January of 1783. They lost everything because of their loyalism, although I do have to say I think Sarah tried. Right, she tried to keep that house. Another name up there, Margaret Locke, she's another case I wanted to talk about. She's another kind of interesting moment. She was left behind when her husband Joshua joined the British troops, and he actually joined William Howell's brigade and went off with them. What we see with Margaret Locke, though, is she was left to care for their home and their three-month-old infant. Margaret was a nurse. So what happened was she was approached to basically create a hospital for wounded British soldiers. She opened her home up for these soldiers. She cared for them. She provided all the materials for four years. And because of her loyalty, she was given safe passage to London and then repaid for the debt of her services. Kind of an interesting twist. Um, I think she kind of took this burden, and I think she turned it into an opportunity. That's what I tend to see with her. Um, and I think Mama did okay in that kind of sense. One other family that struggles significantly in this too is the Wall and Shoemaker family. The Walls, very wealthy. The Shoemakers, even more wealthy. Samuel Shoemaker, whose image is over here, this portrait of him, Give you a little bit of background with Samuel. Um, he was a former mayor of the city of Philadelphia, one of the wealthiest merchants. He had, I think, four estates. I think when I last counted, I was up to like 57 wine glasses. Like, he had stuff. And he was married to Rebecca Wall. Rebecca Wall was widowed, remarried, and married Samuel, and brought her two daughters, Peggy. Um, and Rebecca from her first marriage. And in bringing her daughters over, they kind of came up with a plan. 
When the American Revolution began, Samuel took off almost immediately and joined the British um, troops. And Rebecca was left behind with their children. Her daughters were old enough, however, to protect the family estate. This is where it gets a little hard to believe. But Rebecca actually initially set out and wanted to be a spy for the British. And they heard rumors that she was a spy, so she soon had to leave the city of Philadelphia as well. She went to New York. New York was a loyalist sanctuary at the time. And she left her two daughters behind. Her daughters had to secure all of their family estates and prevent the property from being seized and taken by the Pennsylvania le legislature. It didn't work out. The daughters struggled to hold ownership, and all of their stuff was taken by the state of Pennsylvania. Well, becomes the state. But what we see with this, too, is that her daughters really struggled in their hardship. They left remarkable numbers of letters that kind of detailed the back and forth and what they were trying to do. Her daughters would write to her in New York and they'd say, like, you know, dear mother, we lost this house today. And the agents of confiscation, they took your china that was inside. And I can't imagine, one, that that was an easy letter to write, or two, an easy letter to receive. And they always maintained their loyalty to the British crown throughout this entire kind of moment. The daughters, they tried. They tried so hard to keep the property. But it was all taken and sold in an auction. In the meantime, Samuel and Rebecca decided to relocate at the conclusion of the war, and they settled in New Jersey. They never took formal residence up again in the city of Philadelphia, but I suspect that they did go into the city as their children still lived there. But they always kind of maintained that separation from that space. Another kind of case that I wanted to mention, too, is the issue of violence and separation. When we think about the American Revolution, there's a certain burden that falls on these Loyalist women. One case that I always think about, too, is the Loyalist Mary Kearsley. Mary Kearsley watched her husband get beat almost to death with the butt end of firewalks. He was dragged through the streets with blood streaming down his face. His children witnessed it, and then he was thrown in jail. And his loyalism nearly cost him his life. His wife, Mary, was left back at home while he was in prison, and she had to care for their five children. What's kind of striking about this, too, is that Mary evacuated the city of Philadelphia with the British in 1778. She left her husband alone in prison. She had no hope of seeing them, but she had to make that choice for her children. So she fled and went to London and it's up being her story. So she lost everything, and she was never reunited with her husband. So again, it's this kind of like sad tale, but I do have some good stories, I promise. I will end this on a high note today. For some of these women, it was an opportunity. Jane Bartram is my favorite example from this time period. Jane Bartram had a, let's call it a troubled marriage. She was very wealthy, and so was her husband. Um, this is her uncle's house. And they called it the John Bartram House. You can see it's like a very gorgeous kind of older building outside of Philadelphia. Uh, but Jane and her husband had, again, this troubled marriage. Her husband, who was a very vocal loyalist and very wealthy, he fled immediately at the start of the war. Jane refused to go with him. She stayed behind, and she instead claimed I don't share my husband's pol politics, and I don't want to share his name. She used this opportunity, and his being loyalist, to file for a divorce. And what's really kind of fascinating of this is she didn't make the traditional claims for divorce that you typically see at this time. Most women, if they tried to petition for a divorce, it was often for abuse, um, adultery, were kind of like the two classic examples. What Jane did was she filed on the basis of political differences. She said she couldn't be married to a traitor. And she claimed herself to be this like devout American. What's really fascinating about this is case drags on for a little bit. In 1785, the war is over. Pennsylvania is becoming a state. They're still kind of sorting out what that exactly means. But they decide to grant her petition for divorce.
So she seizes this opportunity to leave her loyalist husband and have a new identity as a patriot woman. Very unique for this time period. The kind of final positive one, too, we can talk about is Elaine's Graham Ferguson. So this is the portrait of Elizabeth when she was much younger. Um, but Elizabeth, she also utilized her husband's departure during the revolution to embrace an independent life. Her husband, Hugh Ferguson, he was a loyalist, and he fled the city of Philadelphia in 1778. But Elizabeth stayed behind. She, too, had a strained, let's go with that word, strained relationship with her husband. And what she decided to do was claim a completely independent political identity. Her husband found out about this and wrote really kind of nasty letters. He kept referring to Elizabeth as the, quote, nasty American, end quote, saying that, you know, he couldn't believe he'd ever married her. And Elizabeth stayed behind. She had a, a lot of personality. When her husband's estate was being confiscated, Elizabeth actively went through and began marking certain possessions as hers. And she said, you can take my husband's stuff, but you can't take mine. I'm a patriot. What she also claimed, too, is that she'd inherited property from family relatives. And she said, again, it's not my loyalist husband's. It's mine. She's in a unique case. Um, they tried to steal her stuff. Right? They tried to take it. They tried to sell it at this auction. And she continued to kind of abate the sales. She would write letters to the state of Pennsylvania, to their kind of governing bodies. I guess they're still a colony at this point. And she would say, please don't take my land. It was left to me, and I love this country. What's also kind of interesting, too, is when they try to hold the public auctions, they bring everybody's stuff into public spaces and sell it. Um, Elizabeth would sit there and try to buy back her own stuff. She wanted to prevent it from being sold to anybody else. In 1781, she went, had one final petition to the Pennsylvania Assembly, and they asked her to grant her the land that had been left to her by her father. She claimed that she, quote, much loved this country, end quote, and because of her patriotism, it should belong to her. Her petition worked. She was exempted from previous acts calling for the immediate sale of confiscated property, and future sale was avoided. She kind of went down in history as this most devoted American woman. She never formally petitioned her loyalist husband, but she also never saw him again. So I think when I kind of consider her case, this was an opportunity. She claimed ownership of property. She exerted her own political opinion. And she also had her own unique political identity. So how do we conclude this? I know that I gave you just a bunch of different examples. But the best way that I like to think about this kind of period in time for loyalist women when we talk about the context of Philadelphia is I like to think of it as one being messy. I think it's really hard for us to kind of make these grand statements when there's so many just different cases that we can discuss. I also think what's very evident in this is that while the American Revolution clearly tore families apart, these women rose to this challenge, and they were truly remarkable. They had to do so much in the absence of their husband and in the absence of honestly having their own political voice. So I think it's a mixed bag. For some, it was a burden. I think that comes out in one of those earlier stories, especially when we consider the care of children. But I also think for others, it presented this great moment of opportunity. For Jane Bartram, it was a divorce. For Elizabeth Graham Ferguson, she became the American. Um, but all together, it kind of shows us an interesting story with that other side of the American Revolution. Thanks.